it is about the search for unity, and I explain. And then I'm going to describe two things, relativity and quantum mechanics. And I'm going to say how bringing these things together will lead to called string theory. And along the way, I'll describe what's called the standard model of particle physics. Okay, so that's the plan. So, let's first begin with sort of the founding beginnings of what we mean by theoretical physics, and that's Newton. And the thing about Newton that's easy to <coughs> take for granted, <coughs> excuse me, is that it's not that he had a mathematical description of gravity. It's not even that he was right. It's the fact that he could explain seemingly very different phenomena, like the Earth going around the sun and apples falling with one thing, or the tides. You see, it's, very, it's something we take for granted now. But the fact that the motion of the planets is to do with gravity is something that's not obvious. Because it, we're used to gravity as things falling down, but the planets never fall into the sun. They go around the sun. So it's completely not obvious why those very different phenomena, or say the movement of the tides, are connected to one, or one idea. So this is a constantly reoccurring theme, that unity is where you have a single explanation for many different things. So I get to quote Picasso. <laughs> Um, a painter should work with as fewer elements as possible, and so should physicists. This is sort of the whole Occam's razor approach, but what you're always looking for is describing as much as possible using as little as possible. Okay, next thing is Faraday and Maxwell and electromagnetism. And what they did, in particular Maxwell, was unify electricity and magnetism. So again, <coughs> you have two very seemingly different things, electrostatics, magnets, they're sort of similar, but they're different. And what they show is that they're different aspects of the same thing. And in doing so, he made a prediction that you could have waves of electricity and magnetism together, and that's what light is. So that was his big discovery that the light that flows into your eye is a wave in the combined electromagnetic field. That electricity and magnetism are just different aspects of the same thing. Again, a unifying principle. <clears throat> Next step, and now we're getting quite contemporary, 1979, was unifying electromagnetism with what's called the weak nuclear force. The weak nuclear force is the force that's associated to radioactive particle decay. Um, it's given by this little diagram here of helium decaying and giving off uh, a beta particle, and that's a typical thing of radioactive decay. And these guys, uh, Weinberg and Salam, unify that actually with electromagnetism. So electromagnetism and this decaying radioactive force are also different aspects of the same thing. Again, a unification that continues. What, what is that called as it, when it's unified? Electroweak force. It's the technical name. <coughs> so, this was the goal, it was very successful. Seemingly different forces in nature appeared as different aspects and faces of a single force. Okay? And that was the continuing goal, that instead of having loads of different forces, the goal was, actually, they should all appear as different aspects of a single one. And they got very far. Electromagnetism weak nuclear force all combined, and there were only two exceptions that were not combined with those that seemed to be different. One was gravity. And one was what's called the strong nuclear force. And the strong nuclear force is the force which actually binds quarks together in the nucleus. And I'll come to what the matter bits are. So, in the end, all the forces in nature that have ever been observed 
come down to gravity. The strong nuclear force, which binds together things inside atoms, and the electroweak force. Only three forces ever observed. This is sort of already remarkable if you think of all of the diverse phenomena that exist in nature. Are you happy with that? Okay, so there's this goal of unity, binding things, etc. So that's fine for forces. And then the next question is what you do about matter, the stuff and building blocks that we are made up out of. This stuff. That's the stuff, matter. So already the Greeks had this idea that <clears throat> you didn't need to have huge amounts of different things to explain all of the matter that we see. If we go smaller and smaller, then the building blocks become fewer and fewer. Okay? So if you look at the skeleton room, you think, ah, well, there are so many different sorts of things in this room. I've got wood, I've got plastic. Instead of got wood, it's no wood. <laughs> yeah, and then we've got plastic and plastic and some metal, different sorts of plastic and plaster and I don't know what, okay? Uh, some textiles, some organic material. All seems very different. And then as you go to smaller things, when you get, then you have, say, we're all made up, all of the things in this room are made up actually of only three elementary particles. Protons, neutrons, and electrons. Three things to explain everything in this room. Just by going smaller and smaller. So that this again is a unity thing. It's saying all the diverse things that we see around us are made up of very simple building blocks, the elementary particles. So I should tell you what they are. So now there's a counting issue, it's like the slide's not very good in the colours. I've put there 18 quarks. If you go to a book, they'll tell you there's six quarks. Um, the reason why I'm counting 18 is I'm trying to be very... Because each quark can be charged in three different ways. So it depends whether you go through six sorts of quark, that can be charged in three different ways, or whether you count a quark that's charged in a different way as a different quark. Okay. And my understanding is that you're very keen on understanding the standard model of particle physics, is that right? Yeah. So I'm not sure that's in here. Well, it is, it is. We'll get there. And six leptons, they are things like electrons, and the six of those. And then we've got the three forces we discussed. So let me, so this is normally the sort of equivalent of the periodic table. What we have, these are the six quarks, and each one of those comes in three different types of charge, called colors. Here are the six different, what are called leptons. <clears throat> the electron, the muon, and the tau. And associated to each one is what's called a neutrino. <coughs> and these are the associated um, forces of electromagnetism, gravity, and the weak force. Okay. Um, there is one more thing which is now added to this table as of this month. Anyone want to tell me? So I'm doing my teacher thing now. Higgs, the Higgs, Higgs boson. The Higgs would be an extra little thing. Well, why aren't you uh, adding antiparticles to that? Don't yeah, so, yeah, exactly. So, you know, counting is all a bit subjective how you count. So there would be antiparticles to all of these things. Interestingly, some of these things are their own antiparticle. The forces often are their own antiparticle. But yeah. And, and like I said, actually each one of these in red have got three different types. So it's, it's a sort of how you count. But indeed, yeah, there's an antiparticle for each one. Okay, so 
I should I'll say a bit about names which you've got on there because we've got a pen that is that completely flawed and expecting too much resources from the university. <sighs> okay. No pen. Joy, never mind, I will just say it. So what are these things? Uh, the U stands for up, the D for down, the C for charm, the S for strange, the T for top, and the B for bottom. And or, they also used to be called truth and beauty, but that seems to have dropped out of parlance these days. And, it, it, and it's because they were discovered in weird ways, and up and down were discovered first, and there were sort of reasons for going up and down. And then there was some weird particle that didn't fit into anything, so they called it the strange particle, when nothing else was there other than up and down. So that was why I got the name strange. Are they arbitrary, or are they, do they hold some quality to them? What do you, what do you, I mean, all names are arbitrary. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> does, does the name... Um, indicate any quality that they have? No. No. It's more to do with the history of it. Okay. So you're saying that the strange was discovered first after up and down, and it seemed to be very strange because it didn't come in a pair. And the charm was called charm because it made the charm and the strange into a pair, so that was charming. <laughs> and then um, there was the B, and that was beautiful. And then they called teach truth because then that also fits it in. So the names are due to historical labelling rather than anything else. Okay. And then we've got the electron, neon, tau, and these are the neutrinos. These are Z and W are the force carriers of the electric weak, uh, the weak force. Gamma is normally the carrier of the electromagnetism. So I guess that makes G carriers of the strong nuclear force. But there are loads of these. There's actually eight of those. <laughs> eight of those. Two Ws, one Z, and one Gamma. Uh, eight was a very big thing when this was all being discovered. Murray Gelman uh, was very keen on Hindu philosophy and like the eightfold way. And that comes from the fact that eight of those. But you know, if you look at anything long enough, you'll see patterns. Does it mean that they're meaningful? Do those eight? They all hold those the same G's, Those G's are eight. Yeah, do they all hold the same quality? No, otherwise they'd be the same. It's, okay. it's, so <clears throat> what, what it really is, is that, so is that, is that they, they, they are the force that combine together the quarks. And I said that each one of those quarks has got three different types of charge. So that Eight of these are there to bind together the different types of charge. So one thing binds together two sorts. You know some weird combinatorics of if I've got three sorts, how many ways do you combine two things of three? It's actually nine, but then for some reason there's one of them doesn't appear. And that's why there's eight of those. So it's to do with how, what sorts of charge they bind together. Okay, so this is the standard model of particle physics. That's all the particles that have ever been seen in the universe, that have ever been measured at CERN or anywhere, and that we have any reason to expect to exist. And so the remarkable thing is, this front column, up, <coughs> down the electron, that makes up most of the matter you've ever seen in your life. Protons, neutrons, all the stuff that makes you up is that electrons. All of these things are the realm of particle accelerators in the cosmos. You will never see these in your life. Okay. Ah, these people want to know that price. Can we put the light down again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's do that. So this is CERN, 
this is how we, this is how we know about this place, this stuff. Um, CERN is enormous. It is impossible to get across the immense human achievement of what CERN has done. So this dotted line is the French-Swiss border. That's Geneva Airport, and this is the ring underneath the ground, which is about 24 kilometers long, I think. And inside, this is the tunnel. Um, and in here is a vacuum. And here they accelerate the particles actually both ways, particle one way and that's particle the other way. And to get some feeling of energy, if the particles at rest here, it receives enough acceleration to reach 99% the speed of light by the time it's done one meter. And then the rest of the energy, because of the particle can't go faster than the speed of light, just goes into making it more and more massive. So it just accumulates and focuses energy. And then they collide them, bang and then they measure them in detectors like this so that tube will go into the middle of this the particles collide they give out loads of things and these things here try and measure what's given out so they can probe the nature at incredibly high energies higher than anywhere just higher than probably almost anywhere naturally occurring at this point in time um, I should say, you know, the CERN is incredibly accurate. So when, when they calibrate all the instruments, you know, it's a huge thing, and they're measuring very small stuff. Um, they need to know, I mean, they found this when they did this for LEP, which was the previous accelerator. Um, they found that they got monthly variations in the results. It seemed very peculiar. Um, but it was because they were sensitive to the tides. It was that big. So it's some large accelerator underneath the ground. And as you have groundwater underneath the ground, it would suffer tidal effects that, of course, would have monthly vet cycles and eye cycles and all these things. And um, that will press down slightly on one bit of the ring compared to the other. And then measure that. When a TGV goes between uh, Lyon and wherever, which is sort of nearby in France, they know. Because just the, um, the extra bit of electricity from it going through the ground, from it being earthed, they pick up. It's the most, it's the most incredible, accurate instrument ever made. Um, yeah, it really is remarkable. So when they're measuring this amazing amount of energy, mm. what what do we learn from those measurements? I mean, what it, what yeah. is good. What good is the question. Purpose? Good what question. is the purpose? So <clears throat> when you bash stuff together, when you bash stuff together, what happens is you convert all of that stuff into pure energy. And then that pure energy can express itself by the creation of particles. So if you want to see some of those exotic particles, you need to create them. Say the truth or the top or whatever, the Higgs. How do you create particles from nothing? You create a concentration of energy. And out of that concentration of energy, nature will produce particles. And they might say, well, how does nature know what particles to produce? So this is where there's the whole quantum aspect in that there is a fundamental randomness in nature. And it will produce all the particles it can randomly. If it's allowed to produce them, in the sense it's got the energy to produce them, nature produces them through random processes. So we learn about nature in a very blunt, brutal way. It's very unsophisticated in some sense. You're just piling loads of energy and see what pops out. So the first thing is, it's not like an experiment you repeat and you get the same thing every time. And this was the whole problem with the Higgs and why it took so long people to do it. Well, you should measure it if you looked. You had to scatter things again and again and again 
then maybe one in a hundred thousand times, something will be produced that's like a Higgs. And you saw that, and then you kept on going until eventually you had enough statistics to say that there was something really there. Okay. So it's a very blunt instrument, despite being, yeah, you just create energy and see what happens. Any other questions? Discovering it, but in where is it its position? Um, does it align to the standard one? If it yeah. does, it does not. In, yeah, it's yeah. not found so, it's meant to be. Good. Yeah. So it's not just that particles have a mass and a charge. In the standard model, what's crucial is how they interact. And um, that model of how they interact. A lot of that's to do with symmetries, and a lot of it's to do with this thing about how you unify those forces. That, that actually constrains very much how particles can interact. Because the forces which describe the interaction are of a very particular sort which allow unification. <clears throat> the question of whether the, the standard model Higgs was, sorry, whether Higgs was the standard model Higgs, was whether it interacted in all the right ways. And so they have to do more and more experiments and see that once the Higgs is there, how does it interact with light? How does it interact with other things? And the answer now, as in really this week, is that actually, or well, maybe last week, is that all the interactions are as expected. But that took another probably year since when they just discovered something with an appropriate mass and so on. Okay. So there's two sorts of things. There's the intrinsic property of the thing itself, and there's the how it interacts with other things. We uh, reach the limits of the uh, energies for the light. No. Or, I mean, so, what proportion have we reached so far? How much more? So they're, they're closing all this down now. In fact, it's closed already. It's stopped. And they'll be upgrading it for two years. Then they'll put it on again. And then they'll have a lot more energy. Now the problem is when I say a lot more, it's all relative. A lot more convincing what they've got, but nature may have a whole bunch of stuff that energy is way beyond them still. That could be true. What can you do? Um, you never know when you're finished. And that's part of the fun. Will it be kind of high enough to just take the thinking they might just take? Supersymmetric yeah. particles. Yeah. Uh, it may or it may not. They want to. But, but will the energy be high enough? No, no, but this is what we don't know. Right. What the. You, you could have supersymmetry, uh, and it could be of a whole different sort with different energy scales. So the problem is if you don't find it, you can't say it's not there, only it's not at those energies. But there's a chance it will be those energies, but we don't know. They're also looking for the graviton, aren't they? So the graviton is not part of this. Oh, okay. Because it is um, it's a, sort of a different beast. The graviton you look for in uh, what's called gravitational waves. So graviton is the particle associated to, <coughs> to gravity and is associated in some sense with gravitational waves. And you look for that in different detectors. <clears throat> and this is amazing. So gravity is all about bending and stretching space. That's general relativity. Space itself can bend and stretch. And when a gravity wave comes through, space itself will stretch one way and contract another and it will keep on doing that as a wave. Imagine a slinky, that's like a one dimensional thing, where you set a wave up like that, and you're now on a rubber sheet where it contracts one way and expands the other way. Can you imagine that? A bit weird, but there you go. So how do you measure that? You have great big um, metal poles, but I don't know if poles, columns, huge, when I say huge, we're talking tens of kilometers long. 
And you want them like that because you want them still and heavy and hard to move. The point is, when space itself expands, they will. You put them in a, in a square, and you measure the distance between them incredibly accurately, which you do with laser interferometry, so they can measure one hundredth the size of an atom. Part. Maybe down to a thousandth down. Which means if there was a detector over there about a mile away, and I went like that, they'd feel the vibration. Right? <laughs> so that's but that's their whole problem because they're looking at changes in the size of space, that sort of size, and the problem is how do you just get rid of the noise? Mm. So what they do is you can't get rid of the noise, mm. so they call them down, they isolate it still, is they put two different sides of the planet. And only if the wa and the wave will go through Earth and through everything, and only if they're synchronized. Or you think there's a wave gone through because they'll move in exactly the same way, just one thing slowed down by the you know the time the wave gets to go across. But that turned out still difficult, so now they're going to put it in space. <laughs> so that's the search of the gravity. Right. Gravitational waves. Okay. Thank you. But I thought gravity was a force. It is a force. But it's also a particle. Yes. So all forces come with particle equivalents that, that are the carriers of the force. So this is, dates back to the whole quantum mechanics thing that everything is both a particle and a wave in some sense. And everyone's now familiar with that idea in matter that we have probability waves and quantum mechanics and stuff that makes things up and sometimes we thought it was a wave. The same thing is true of um, forces. <coughs> that the force isn't just a case of pulling something, Something's got to go through and communicate what is doing the pulling. Because how can the thing know that the thing that's doing the attraction is there? Say, us, me, and the Earth. If I'm away from the Earth, how do I know physically that the Earth is there pulling me? There must be some carrier of the information. And that's the force carrier. And so every force has a particle associated to it which carries the force. You're looking at me like I've gone mad. Well, I'm still okay. So then, if you, you have a, a, if you have, yeah, <laughs> and I wouldn't know the difference. Um, but if you have a particle just sticking with graviton, if yeah. there's a if there's a particle that's yeah. saying, "Pull Dr. Berman's feet back mm. to the ground." Mm. How does that particle communicate with the ground? Because it's not there either. Yeah, so no, then no. there's got to be Good. a, a wave in no. them, a string. So the way, so the way that you view it is. Everything that is charged with respect to the force, so in the case of gravity, that's actually everything. But if we had an electric charge, for example, that would give out the electric force current, and there'd be particles that would be actually giving out particles. And then I would feel those particles, and the bigger the charge, the more particles it gives out. So there's like a stream of particles? Stream, yeah. Ah. Yeah, you, you think of them as a stream of virtual particles, yeah. Now they're virtual. They're virtual, okay, virtual just means it's through the energy. Don't read too much into the word virtual. It just means there's not a constant stream of energy flowing out of the system. Because obviously then things will lose energy. So it, it gives out the particles but at no energy cost. That's what the virtual means. Okay. Because <laughs> if things were just given out particles, you just capture them and you get an infinite source of energy, right? So that's that's the word virtual means. It's no energy cost. And the bigger the thing is, the, the more of these things it gives out. So that's how we know it's a big mass or a small mass. It's giving out loads of these things, or a little bit. So if you've got electrical um, source doing that, yeah. Virtual, like, yeah, you yeah. Do, like you've also got empty space where you've got virtual particle. particle well, no, exactly. This is the point. This is the point. Yeah. 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 Which, right. No, no, that's the point. The reason yeah. why. In some sense, it's all the same story. I'm allowed to have virtual particles because I don't need energy to make virtual particles. So the vacuum and nothing in it, no energy, still has this constant sea of virtual particles popping in that existence. And it's those virtual particles which become the force carriers. 
it's the same, exactly the same process. Let's, stick, let's, let's continue this, because the rest of the talk is more to do with string theory, and I think it's, it's better to just go on to that stand more, so let's just keep that. Um, more questions. Because this is really all the standard model is. It's a set of particles, it's a set of forces, and it's how they interact. Everything. Well, but we started with the standard model as, <coughs> as, as a concept, but I think all the artists have responded to it differently. So we have people who are interested in the scientists and people who are interested yeah. in other theories Things, or yeah. <laughs> geometry. And it's gone yeah, yeah. every which way. I can imagine. But that was kind of the. Well, there's so much. There's just so much that yeah. it's amazing. Yeah. They are searching for dark matter. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. <coughs> right, so dark matter. Mm. Uh, what, what does that mean? It means from the gravitational effects in the universe, you can see that there is a presence of a whole bunch of stuff that we can't see. Now, it could be that we can't see it simply because it's cold and dark and it's ordinary matter. So that would be non-exotic dark matter. Or, <coughs> there's, certainly, there's a certain component of these, that there's a sort of whole, I don't really want to use the word gas, but a whole load of elementary particles of a sort that's not the type I've described there, that is, for example, floating around in galactic cores. So there's a feeling that dark matter exists because of its effect. It has a gravitational effect. And you can fit it, say, well, there's particles that seem to exist whose gravitational interactions are such they don't fit into standard model particles. So it's an open question whether there's some model problem, maybe it can be explained by ordinary particles and it's just we can't see them, or whether there are genuinely evidence for new particles that are not in that table. So when at CERN they find a new particle, if they ever do, one of the things they will immediately do is say, could this be a dark matter candidate and explain things that they think are existing in the galaxies, but they've not really understood why. When you use it cold, why why is you use it cold? Oh, because we can only see things as are hot. Oh, it's like this red ship by like No, no, we just only see things hot. We see the sun, very hot. There's there's little asteroids and bits of planet on the outer reach of the solar system that are cold, and you can't see them, why can't you see them? Because they don't give out any light. Could that, could that be in some, could that kind of be sort of, you know, we were talking about earlier, um, we were about heat then, could that be a part of, or a process of heat then? No, no, because heat death would be where everything reaches the oh, same temperature. Okay. Equilibrium, right? Yeah, in equilibrium. So here the whole point is we're very much out of equilibrium, but the sun that's very hot, and then we're way cold, relatively. And um, heat death is when everything reaches the same temperature. So this one is it's cold stuff, in cold than us. So you only see things that are hot, because it's hot stuff gives out light. Like a fluorescent light bulb, and fire. So that's how we see stuff in the universe, is when it's hot. If you've just got a rock that's cold, very hard to see it. Because you can't shine a light on it if it's not near a sun. So if you've got stuff that's far away from a sun or a star, and it's not itself hot, how would you ever see it? Couldn't you measure it? Mass of the particle, the good, or so, charge, or so you can measure its mass by its gravitational effects on other things, and that's exactly why we know these things are there. So we know, that's what we mean by dark matter, because we see its gravitational effect. But what it is, whether it's one of these particles or something else, let's say just a whole bunch of dust, could be very ordinary, could be something very exotic. What about dark energy? Yeah, that's um, that's very interesting. So, <clears throat> what happens is energy and mass. So we, we're used to this, right? We're used to the fact that mass <coughs> is associated to gravity. We're used to e equals mc squared, which is the equivalent between energy and mass. So therefore, energy also causes gravitational attraction. And now you can look and see how things gravitationally attract or even repel. 
and try and fit in a sort of energy that will do that. So dark energy is meant to explain a sort of overall gravitational repulsion that actually happens in the universe that's of a very particular sort. It is not understood. No clue whatsoever is the real answer. At the moment, it's put in by hand with some sort of fitting to the way it sort of fits. Its origin, its causal link to the rest of this stuff, not known. There's a quote actually from an article called, um, it was to do with your work with Grenville. Oh, Grenville, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it was, um, which I thought was interesting, it says at the most fundamental level, it is a broken symmetry that oh. defines the nature of the universe. Yeah. Could you just okay. explain right. a little, little bit on that? You've done your research. So, um, so this is actually associated to the Higgs thing. So I said that there's this unification. So the unification of electroweak force. But quite manifestly, electromagnetism is not the same as weak nuclear decay. And then, so there's a mechanism by which, so the, the idea is that very high energies, they are the same thing, completely the same thing. But then at very low energies, what happens is, the symmetry between these two forces is broken. I want to give an example. It's all about pen. This is good. Give me an example of how all the time nature spontaneously breaks symmetry. If I put a pen up like this, then there is an equal probability. It's a fully symmetric system symmetrically around the pen. There's no preferred direction in which this pen will fall because, well, all the directions are the same. But there's a lower energy configuration for the gravity, which will pick out a direction. See, so that's that pointing that way. Do it again. Different way, but as soon as it's fallen, and is in the lower energy state, because it's now flat on the table, it will pick a direction even though the law of gravity and how the pen is oriented is completely symmetric. So every time I do it, it points in a different direction because it will have equal probability of anywhere. But where it ends up breaks the symmetry, breaks that circular symmetry of where it's going to be. Because it's made a choice. It's sort of made a choice. And when it, as soon as it's made the choice, even though all choices are equal, so it's symmetric because all choices are equal, it's still got to make a choice to lie down. Now nature works very much like this in terms of these forces. It's, it has a symmetry at high energy, which is sort of unstable, like the pen. It's a higher energy state the pen's have. And it's an unstable state, because clearly when I let it go, it's almost impossible to balance it perfectly. And it's in that symmetric state, but it's, it's unstable, the symmetric state. So it falls down and it ends up in this state of broken symmetry where it was previously perfectly rotation symmetric now it's got broken symmetry um, and that is the actual the Higgs mechanism that we have forces in nature which are perfectly symmetric but the Higgs interaction is the interaction which breaks the symmetry so that it, at lower energies and if you like it collapses down we get a different set of forces, electricity, and the weak nuclear force. So is this happening constantly? Or yes, it, it sort of happened. Of it sort of happened. The universe did it at the beginning. Right. It was very hot to the universe. It was at high energy. When it cooled down and it needed to relax and you know, like letting go of the pen, the whole universe picked out, if you, if you will, a direction and broke that symmetry. So if there were several big bangs, so it's indeed, fair, yes, you could have it picked in different ways. Different Absolutely, fair. yeah. And people think of that, that there might even be different regions of the universe where it's broken in different ways. And they look for consequences of that. So this is the whole, and, and the sort of byproduct of that was, is very hard to explain, but that's one of the reasons why we have masses. So that, that's the origin of that comment. Mm. 
Um. Yeah. I looked up an explanation for something and I, could, I couldn't find it, so I thought maybe you could help. Sure. Me. Um, <coughs> the geometry of the universe. Yes. A dodecahedron whose facing sides are glued together? Yeah. What in the world? What is that? It's probably not true. Um, that was. <laughs> That could well have been a conjectured thing. Um, I think the, the guy's name was Poincaré or Poincaré. Oh, Poincaré. Yeah. Yeah. He's certainly a very clever man. Um, he's had to do with chaos theory. He has been to do with chaos theory. He did the three body problem and chose to true. I don't think that thought that comes about. The problem is I don't know, because he might have meant it in some very specific context. All I can say is... Well, when I looked it up, everyone seems to say that, that yes, that's the shape of... Yes, yes, that all these... Well, I mean, Google, general Googling. Google. And I just kept getting... <laughs> but it was can like... Can I suggest you just don't read any more articles on Google? <laughs> no, no, seriously. You could just... That's nothing to do with it. Dodecahedrons with opposite places are not the shape of the universe. I can't help you if Google says that. It's just not true. Oh, okay. <laughs> um... Try a book like uh, The Elegant Universe by Brian Greene, and, he, and, and they'll explain very much the geometry of the universe. I, I, I know it seems like a get out, but the problem is, there's a lot of people said lots of things, and then what often happens is, these quotes get on, and that leads to very high Google ratings, but the stuff that's true because it's not an easy sound bite, or maybe encoding mathematics, does not get a Google rating because it's not easily repeatable. So there's a whole cultural issue of how science is reported here. It's very interesting, which is um, what hits big on the internet is often not a reflection of reality whatsoever, but a reflection of what's easily transmittable. Are there any other books that you that you think we could understand? I think I mean yeah, there's um, I mean there's a whole host. Um, Let's think. Standard model physics, I mean, dare I say it, there's, um, there's, uh, Brian Cox up on that. Yeah. He's, he's not too bad, right? <laughs> <laughs> he's got more hair than me. <laughs> you know, there's really, I mean, there really is, the, 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 the huge numbers of books on the standard model. Um, well, the Origin of the Universe is a book by Steven Weinberg called The First Three Minutes, which Brilliant. Um, yeah. Can I ask a question which isn't directly yeah. related? Sure, sure. Anything, anything. I used to do with the uh, holographic principle. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, yes. to do some work on. Yeah. Now, I've uh, sort of read different formulations of it. Yeah. That good. physics inside the a volume yeah. uh, is linked to physics on the surface area. That's or correct. Very good. Information contained in a volume. Uh, it corresponds to information on the surface area. Both of those are true. Yeah, or phenomena, I don't know. Both of those okay, are true. Okay, they're all kind of the same. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, yes. so I have a set of questions yeah, go on. to check whether I've understood correctly. Yeah, yeah. When it says uh, inside a volume, you yeah. see any volume, any so volume. can it be any, sh the volume can be of any shape whatsoever, you yeah. say any shape or design, yeah. doesn't have to be a sphere. Doesn't have to be a sphere. Okay. Um, it's strongest in a sphere because if you just count the ratio of volume to area, it's it's biggest in a sphere. Right. Okay. That's the most efficient. So it's clearly the most in the bit where it's the strongest thing in the sense of all the information right. containing the least possible thing to be a sphere. Because if you imagine having a really craggy Thing, you've got much more area, make loads more area. Yeah. It's how your lungs work. Right. Yeah. Right. So the sphere is the strongest version. Okay. Um, the other question is: Is there an exact correspondence between the information contained there is in the surface, yeah. or is it kind of fuzzy inside? No, there there is an exact correspondence when we have the interior geometry described by single vanity and space. That's a technical caveat that's very important. 
But indeed, you're sort of right. There is always a fussification inside, and that's because of quantum gravity. So what, in the holographic thing, is, is gravity itself, there's no gravity on the boundary. And it's because there is this notion of what's called a Planck scale inside, which is, if you like, a pixel size. So how can you have the same amount of information inside and on the boundary? It's because you've got pixel size and block it out into volumes on the inside, and then you map it and stuff on the boundary without that pixelation. So the pixelation is can be read as being sort of the presence of on the inside. Oh, then no pixelation on the out, no pixelation on the boundary, only pixelation on the inside. Because okay, right. the pixelation comes from gravity. Okay. Um, the other thing is that uh, the other version of, of that I read is that, uh, yeah. for instance, around the black hole, the event horizon yeah. got entropy. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so and it's radiation. Yeah. Gorky radiation. Yeah. And entropy is measured by count of all the microstates. Yes. Within, Very good. Yeah. Within that. Uh, okay. It's the, the thing is, microstates, well, is there a particular level, for instance, the microstates we're talking about, are they kind of at the elementary particle level, oh. atomic, molecular, um, sub -sub -sub -sub. or even further down? So the, the, the lowest fundamental, that's the whole point. You, to make that work and understand that, you have to understand the basic building blocks. The microstates in that are measuring the smallest building blocks of choices in all the possible microscopic states. Oh, so all the possible configuration of, not yeah. just the, mic the count of microstates. No, no, that's the point. Counting the microstates is all the possible configurations within the allowed, say, temperature right. mass of the black hole. That's why the entropy is so big. Right. And the microstates, you might say microstates of the elementary particles. Yeah. But we, we, but it seems to me that at the moment, we, our knowledge stops at the, the particles we know, let's say four yeah. or so on. Yeah. Uh, in a hundred years time, they have proved string theory. Yeah, so yeah, exactly. is it count of strings? Or, you know, I mean, no, so this where, is the whole where do you stop? What Hawking did, was give us the thermodynamics of black holes but and say it's related to counting microstates. He didn't tell what the microstates were. So and he still works about whatever the microstates are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But can I But you it? want to you want to explain it in terms of those microstates and that's not yet achieved. And that's one of the goals of string theory. So you're right, you put your finger on it, you want to explain the Hawking thing in terms of the microstates. It's not yet being able to be done, but one of the goals of string theory will be to do that. By saying, ah, we've got the fundamental description of nature, we can check if that fundamental description of nature is right because it will produce the counting that Hawking had. That's the goal. And in some cases they've made that work, but not all. Okay. Um, He's done a lot of work, last John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, go on. Uh, the last one, again, this is on the face of some of the readings. Uh, does it make sense to say, which came first? The chicken or the egg? Yeah. No. So what was It doesn't question? make sense to Which say that. Which came first? Uh, well, whether the, the surface area... Oh, no, no, no. Okay. No, no. There's no notion of causality, it's just equivalence. And, and so all this thing that people talk about as being holographic effects of... It's, it's a choice. Phenomenon on the boundary. And, uh, it's, it's a choice of description. You can describe it as you're living on the boundary, or you can describe it as living on the ball, and then the equivalent choice, but it's a choice of what your description is. Right, so, so the formulation I read, which mm. is more of the popular bit, yeah. as that perhaps we are holographic effects of the, the actual phenomenon on the boundary is just I, I think that's I think that's a sort of wishful causality. You can't show the causality as an equivalence, not a causal relation. You see that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Is, is Max Planck the father of quantum theory? Yes. Good. Are there any other very key? I mean, I've got quite a few people involved. Oh, you want for quantum mechanics? Like Heisenberg, Heisenberg and Bohr. Dirac, Pauli, yeah. um, Bohr, Fermi, Reins. Yeah. I'm what on the right track. Reins? Reins. R E I N E S? Never heard of him. All right, I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> right, so the other ones I'm, I'm good with. The other ones are very good, yeah. Great, good. Thank you. Last question, and then I've got to dash, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, it's been a bit rushed. Um, 
It's only sort of more figures. Yes, I've got a question. Yeah. Um, in terms of, is it right to say that maths, I know maths goes beyond human perception. Yeah. Um, and the best we can do in relating to pushing forward and trying to perceive yeah. these things is to kind of use analogies because we kind of refer to what can only refer yeah. to what exists. I think we discussed this before, yeah, yeah. Is, it, is it math is a language which allows us to describe things that we cannot imagine. So that it's out, it can operate, it act, operates outside our perceptual things. Outside right. our perceptual things, which is why we have four dimensions, 20 dimensions, second. I'm really sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's no such thing as dodecahedral space, which was my project. So does that screw up your <laughs> Go for the sphere instead. That's easier.